Hi folks, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you, whatever time you're joining us, wherever you're joining us from. Thank you so much for joining for our chat today about social media and the mind. I'm Jen Kearney and I'm a digital communications manager for McLean Hospital and I'm joined today by Dr. Jackie Sparling. And if this was an in-person thing, I would ask whoever's joined to raise their hand if they use social media. I'd maybe even be so bold to, as to ask who's on social media as we're having this conversation. And by the way, totally judgment-free zone here. Uh, if you're active on social media on a regular basis, it's pretty likely that you're feeling sort of reliant on it for many reasons, social networking, engagement, feeling connected to others, but you might find yourself checking it a little bit more often than you'd really like. Uh, you might even unconsciously reach for your device or find yourself answering a work email and then questioning how you found yourself on LinkedIn. And the last part might have been a personal anecdote from this morning. So just what on earth is making all of these platforms so habit forming? And even more importantly, why is it so hard to snap out of these habits? So these questions and so many more are exactly why I'm thrilled to have Jackie with me today to talk all about the science of social media. What's making it so habit forming, how it's overuse is impacting kids and adults differently and ways that we can change our own digital consumption habits to better improve our mental health. So if you are unfamiliar with her, Jacqueline Sperling PhD is a clinical psychologist, faculty at Harvard Medical School, and the co-founder and co-program director of the McLean Anxiety Mastery Program at McLean Hospital. She specializes in working with youth who present with anxiety disorders and or obsessive compulsive disorder, as well as providing parent guidance by using treatments like behavioral parent training to help families address children's internalizing and externalizing behaviors. And as if she doesn't have enough on her plate, she's also the author of Find Your Fierce, How to Put Social Anxiety in Its Place. So Jackie, I know this conversation has been a long time coming and that you had worked alongside me in our social media content for McLean's website. So I'm super excited to actually have the conversation with you in person. I want to start by asking what is good about social media and with a focus on the negative, because we've been talking about that so often, are there benefits to actually using it? Sure. It's not all bad, right? Social media apps, they create opportunities for direct communication. They also allow for local businesses to share posts about specials that they may have. So community members can support their local businesses. They also can be platforms upon which people can use to rally support for fundraisers and other meaningful causes. So what exactly is making social media use unhealthy then? So social media use has been linked to depression, anxiety, sleep disturbances, low self-esteem, among others. And then a key aspect, those differentiate, differentiate between the different types of use of social media apps. So that can be active use, passive use, and even more specifically self-oriented and other-oriented use. And I can give examples of each. So an example of active use might be where someone is exchanging messages directly with a peer. And that could be an example of a healthy way of supporting a social connection. An example of passive use might be when someone is scrolling through one's newsfeed. That can create opportunities for comparisons. And those comparisons may negatively impact one's mood and self-esteem. So for example, you're seeing that someone else received more likes for their post compared to your post. You may also see examples of social exclusion you see friends who are posing in a picture at an event and you weren't invited to that event. And in addition, the use of filters with pictures distorts people's concept of what is a typical body type. And the use of filters can also negatively impact one's self-esteem and body image. The self-oriented activities like updating one's profile, those are less linked to a negative impact on one's mood and self-esteem. It's really the other oriented activities where you are looking at other people's profiles, the comments, the likes that are more linked to the negative impact on one's mood and self-esteem. Can you elaborate a little bit on like the mindless scrolling and what is making social media and other apps so habit forming? Sure, it's this unpredictable frequency or what we call a variable schedule of reinforcement that is the most reinforcing schedule. And so it's, you're not knowing how many likes you're gonna get for a post, what people are gonna say, what people are doing at different times. All these different experiences facilitate more frequent checking behavior and a dopamine feedback loop. 
Dopamine is a neurotransmitter in the brain that's involved in the reward system. And any behavior that gets rewarded by the brain is likely to continue. So is that dopamine system, um, one thing that comes to mind is when you like pull down on an app and it has the spinning wheel and then something pops back up and, you know, it's, I'm an adult, I've been to a casino before. It reminds me of a slot machine. Is there some sort of similarity in terms of like why it's structured that way? You absolutely nailed it. And actually a slot machine is often an example of my use. It's almost like a play to you. Uh, but yes, yeah, so it's this intermittent or unpredictable schedule of reinforcement. And actually those slot machines and I know in the past are actually set up statistically for people to fail. So why are they so reinforcing, right? It's like, if you knew that you never were going to get money back, you would not sit in those chairs. But people have like, you know, they've been sitting in those chairs for an extended period of time, just for that one chance, they might get that jackpot. And that's because like, you don't know how many likes you're going to get. You put a post on it, you keep checking, like, did I get another like? Or did someone post another comment? What did they say? Or did this person get more likes than I did? And there's that you don't know. Or what are they going to post next? And so I think it's that unpredictable nature that then reinforces people logging on. I also feel like, and you're the expert, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but it almost feels like when you think of like a penny slot, people go, well, it's only a penny. If I spend, if I do it a hundred times, it's only a dollar. What's the big deal? So if people are constantly opening their apps and they're going, oh, I'm only going on for a minute, it's really not a big deal. But a hundred times of that, you've lost almost two hours of your day. It adds up. And I think if you're thinking about also the different types of use, like if you're going and updating your profile, that's one thing. But if you are seeing having these experiences for comparison and it's making you feel worse about yourself, that definitely does take a toll. I'm curious about the benefit of trying to keep kids away from using apps, especially if all of their friends are using them. It seems like it's a little um, like damned if you do, damned if you don't, where they're going to feel left out if they're not on it. But if they're going on it and seeing that they're being left out anyway, it's kind of a self-fulfilling cycle of misery. So I'd say forbidding youth to have access altogether can backfire. So I'd say it's important for families to develop a specific screen time plan in general. And then as part of that plan, it includes the use of social media apps. And then I think it's also important for parents to inform teens, give them the information about the impact that different types of social media use can have on one's mood and self-esteem. Then teens can have this information to empower them to make changes to their behavior. So how do we talk to kids about digital habits without coming off as being overbearing or bossy? I know a lot of times parents want to approach their kids in a friendlier manner, but you just got to be the authority figure sometimes. Is it even possible to have a middle of the road conversation? Teens do best when you offer rationale as to why something is happening. If you just go in because I said so, it's you're not going to get usually a receptive response. But if you give a rationale like this, I'm presenting the screen time plan for the family because I've learned how um, some strategies that might help our physical and mental health and explain why, then they might be more receptive to hearing what you're about to say. It's also critical for parents to follow the screen time plan that they implement at home. Teens will be much more likely to adhere to a plan if their parents are modeling healthy habits. If you want your teens to put their phone away at dinner, it's going to be key for parents to do the same. What in your professional opinion would you consider to be an appropriate restriction for adolescent use of social media sites? Uh, The person who wrote in said specifically Instagram and Snapchat, but I'm sure this applies to all of them. So I think it's going to depend on the age of the child as well in terms of like also family values and culture. I would say like, it's really important for all caregivers involved to talk together and to have a united front, come up with a plan first before presenting it to the family. That it's not necessarily up for negotiation. I mean, parents may adapt it over time, how they see fit. But you can decide whether it's like a certain amount of time that you want or it's spending on the app or if it's like after certain activities have been completed, like when's it going to be used? And I would say get as concrete and specific as possible because if it's vague, then it's it's set, it's almost like a setup for conflict, right? Or you get these questions sprung on you, but like, what about a sleepover? Like, what about vacation? And you're like, I did not think about that ahead of time. And then you're put on the spot. So the more you can think these things through and have a plan in place and talk about it with your family ahead of time, then they know the plan and they can read it accordingly. And I would say like, it could be particularly like for younger kids, you want them like, 
turning in their phones at a certain time and are reviewing or you're reviewing activities together or families can have this part of the screen time plan or um, if kids on Instagram or on Snapchat, they wanna follow some, they don't know directly, but they have to ask permission first. And then parents can actually preview the post that this person is airing out there to see, is it appropriate for my child to see this? That's, it seems like a similar response to what I was going to ask next, which is, you know, how can caregivers ensure that their kids are using social media in ways that are safe and appropriate? Do you have any suggestions for even how to approach that conversation with them? I think as part of the screen time plan with families, it's really important to include all of those aspects in there in terms of like how their teens to be using it. Um, and I think there are you know multiple ways, and particularly if you have a younger teen who's first starting out on using the apps, um, it can be important to have as part of the plan that parents review certain posts or that they have certain idea to see how they're using the apps. And you know these posts are permanent fingerprints, and that can be really tough to grasp grasp for a teen whose frontal lobes have not been fully developed, right? And so they have to learn to be comfortable that their post might, think of them as like being up on a billboard, right? They have to be comfortable thinking like, would you put that up on a billboard? You know, let alone have your parents review the post. It, think about the billboard. It's much more public than your parents are the least of your concern, right? And so that might then help them feel like, oh, my parents are going to see that. Then that might make me think a little bit before I post this, right? To have a little bit more um, thought that goes into something before they post and share things. I think it can also be important for parents to have regular conversations with their children and youth to see what are the takeaways from their social media use. I think this can also enlighten parents to see like how children are interpreting certain behaviors, certain images on there, and also they can see how the use is affecting their teens. So if my child wants to sign up for a social media site or an app, what should I be on the lookout for to make sure that it's safe for them to use? Should I myself join the platform to check it out and see if it's, you know, any red flags might be popping up that way? I think, you know, you can check out some of these like, you know, profiles, like what type of media are shared on these different apps? They want to explore that. And I think that other aspect is part of the plan to see like, having your teens ask permission to follow someone they don't know directly. I mean, if it's a computer, you know the family, I think you know, that can be fine that they're having, they can have direct com communication that way. But if it's a celebrity, someone's now identified as an influencer, you wanna make sure that they're having a positive influence on your child and to check out what kind of posts they're having. One thing that I've noticed is that with social media, people really only post good things. A lot of it ends up being a highlight reel and they're not really showing the reality of what's happening behind the smoke and mirror, so to speak. Is it healthy to be kind of honest and transparent and vulnerable on social media? Or do you find that this might be problematic or backfire? Um, where, you know, where does that divide lie? It's really tricky. And you have a really important point that I think also plays a role into that, um, negative impact on one's mood, right? Because people are just showcasing, you know, it could be a shot that was taken like 24 times before they got the, you know, what image that they wanted to have or use a filter um, or only showing their travels or great social opportunities that they have. People aren't really posting pictures of bad hair days or really tough, challenging, painful days that they're having. Um, and at the same time, is that really the platform that you wanna use? to share something that's really deeply personal to yourself. I think it is really important to practice making oneself vulnerable in order to establish strong connections with others. Um, and then think about what is the context in which one might do that. So I think practice making yourself vulnerable in live conversations, right? Whether it's a direct communication, a phone call, an in-person gathering, I think those would be great spaces to do that. I think that's a much better starting point too, because you can get people's reactions in real time and it doesn't have that like glossed over filter. People can't think about what they want to say, type it out, erase it, so on and so forth. So they can actually give you a genuine and honest response as to what you're sharing. Um, what are some of the signs and symptoms that using social media is either contributing to or causing mental health struggles? Sure. So one can look out for changes in mood, sleep, a desire to socialize or engage in once were previously deemed pleasurable activities. The list was not exhaustive, but it can offer some ideas of what might change 
Um, I'm also a firm believer that seeing is believing. So in terms of like one can do a behavioral experiment to kind of see how these the social media apps are affecting one's mood and self-esteem. So one can, um, this behavioral experiment might look like rating one's mood before they use an app on a scale of zero to 10, 10 being the most intense you could ever experience an emotion, zero, not at all. So before you use an app, you can say, I'm sad and happy, four worried, maybe three a little angry, and then use that. Pay attention to how you're using it, actively, passively, and self-oriented and other oriented ways. Re-rate your mood afterward. If you start to notice that you are less happy and you're feeling worse after using the app, you can use those data to motivate changes in your behavior. And then you have some direct evidence of how they're impacting your mood. I'm curious, based on the work that you're doing, mostly focused in anxiety and OCD, have you noticed any upticks in anxiety, depression, or OCD that's associated with social media usage? Have patients reported that they feel worse after using it? Absolutely. I think, you know, that um, uh, without revealing any personal information, I think generally um, what I've noticed that there, first of all, there are just a lot of concerns about even um, what to say if there's social anxiety, about what they want to put out there, or just like having just the right image or also then comparing the social exclusion is big, particularly if you are a student in junior high. I think, you know, the fact it's just a whole other level of relational aggression that can happen, meaning that it's not physical aggression, but it's in terms of like exclusion, spreading rumors, people posting snarky comments, and people feel almost like um, with that barrier of a screen, they feel more emboldened to share things. I can't imagine someone would do to someone's face, but they feel more likely to be able to do those things. Um, so I think that could be a kind of issue. It seems like young kids are spending a lot of time watching shows and playing games on screens. Do you have any insight into how much screen time is actually healthy for younger children? So it gets to that um, on average, there's a recommendation of no more than like two hours of recreational screen time. It's not evolved over time. You just want to make sure that, I mean, particularly in the pandemic, we become so reliant on use of screens. Um, you just want to make sure it's not replacing other activities, right? That it's not replacing getting out and being physical and doing sports or extracurricular activities that are allowing you to be active, not replacing social outings that are live or in person. Um, you want to make sure that they're able to do their more typical everyday activities and that these are just sort of like an adjunct. Um, right. Can you provide a little bit of clarity on the types of screens that we're talking about for screen limits? Does, is that just, you know, like phones and laptops or does that actually include TV time as well? I would say recreational screen time. That's really important. I'm glad you brought that up for the family screen time plan. You want to get really concrete. So this is anything with a screen that using recreational TV, laptop, iPad, phone, it could, you know, if families want to include Kindle, it's up to them if they want, but particularly because it, it can affect their sleep hygiene. So you want to make sure that in particular, um, teens are not on their screens at least an hour before bed. So anything that's recreational, find out the window of time you want them doing it and when they turn those screens off. If it's a family movie night, I wouldn't count, I mean, I was going to say, encourage families not to count that as like their screen time hours. So I feel like you're probably going to have teens be like, well, fine, I'm not going to spend time with you. I'd rather do it with these, um, independently. So you can have that as a separate um, amount of screen time, but if it's more like they're on their phone by themselves, I think giving about recreational video games. And the do you have advice about how to talk to your loved ones about setting limits on their screen time? Obviously, you know, trying to approach it a little bit non-confrontationally, but I imagine because of the pandemic, we're all a little bit more glued to our devices. And if one of us in a partnership wants to snap out of it, it can be kind of hard when you seem like you're pot calling the kettle, you know? I think, um, so I'm in the mindset I would recommend, you know, suggest saying, hey, there's, this is what I've learned about how social media use or, you know, if this went to be can affect one's mental health, I've decided to make some changes. I'm wondering if you're interested in hearing what I learned. And if you had yes, then you have an invitation to hear what you have to say and an openness to listen. Um, that can be received much differently versus like, I think you should 
stop that and do this differently, right? That's not good for you. And people often might like shut their ears and just have a knee jerk reaction because they're like they're being told what to do and um, not often being hurt as well. But if you're sort of like, hey, this is what I, you know, or what would you be interested in hearing? Like the same goes with like teens too, right? That you are giving them information and then also can empower them to make different behavior choices. You have teed me up beautifully for the next question. Someone wrote in saying that they struggle between wanting to use an app that controls screen time for their teen, but also wants to build trust with them in the hopes that they'll actually control their own time on their own devices. So do you have any suggestions about which path to take, or do you suggest that parents limit screen time by using an app that controls teen and child usage? I suggest starting with... um, the screen time plan where it's actually giving some locus of control for the teens, right? Where it's not like you're cracking down and then sort of like turning off all their apps or their apps just disappear. I think that those are some like backup options if you find you're having some challenges. But really empowering teens is to be able to, whether it's like you're turning your phone or all screens at a certain hour, you know, like that's part of the screen use plan. And you can do it a couple of different ways. It could be like how you earn your screen time the next day is if you turn it in by a certain amount of time, right? If not, you skip a day and try again the next day. Um, it could be if like you're using a reward system for someone that like they get a point or star or check for every time you turn the phone by a certain time and then they could use that point system to cash in for anything else that might be rewarding for them. Not necessarily things that have to cost money, but something that might be rewarding for them. Like picking what they want for dinner or something like that. Or it could also be like a, if it is something that costs money, like a Spotify, you know, subscription for a month or something like that, you know, they can cash those in. So I think create a plan where it gives them an opportunity to actually actively participate in this plan and not feel like, you know, they're being told what what to do. I love that you've provided a suggestion that is kind of flipping the gamification on its head because we all know gamification works. It's why we all enter sweepstakes and play game. Like we enter contests and all of that stuff because we all want the chance at something better. So for you to actually take the gamification of social media and flip it around to say, well, if you spend less time on your device, you'll actually be able to gain an incentive in real time. That's a really, that's a really interesting approach to it. Well, I appreciate your support of that because I'm on the mindset that you're never too old for rewards. And I wonder if any of you know, the viewers out there have any of like the, I'm not promoting a certain store or anything, but like, you know, there's like the Starbucks app, you don't know that the Starbucks app will give you legitimate stars for every time you make a purchase that you can then cash in. And sometimes it's like double star day and that motivates people to then go make a visit. So like you're never too old for rewards. Those things are designed for even adults. So. Yep. And the fact that it's a gold star too is like, just harkens (laughs) right back to your childhood. (laughs) Exactly. Um, So if you can find a way to make it more motivating, um, then that would be my suggestion. And Katie, I just want to put out there too, is that something that I noted was that they could earn their screen time the next day. This is a key wording choice. So you want to make sure that you're not taking away screen time. I would just remove that phrase from the vocabulary. It seems that kids often feel like these screens are like an unalienable right or an appendage and they are a given. They actually are a privilege, right? You know, like parents are required to give food, clothing, and shelter and things above that from beyond that are privileges. And so to know that you're not taking anything away, but there can be ways when you come up with a screen time plan that have your children earn their screen time use. It's not just a given. And so that can be something that you fold in there in terms of like, whether it's like they turn their phones in at a certain time and that's how they earn it or with homework completion and things like that. Uh, we've had a couple of folks write in saying that they've had hesitation in getting their child their own digital device because they're concerned about another distraction. And we live in an overwhelmingly distracting world to begin with. Phones aren't helping anybody, but a lot of their friends have one or multiple devices and there's that feeling of FOMO, the feeling of missing out. Their kids feel left out. Do you have any suggestions on how they can manage these situations? This is really tough and I, and I feel for families when you know, like they want, they're being pulled in multiple directions, right? They feel a sense of what they value for their family and at the same time, they don't want their children to be left out of social interactions. And 
I, from what my family says, the situation is not too different from what we would experience before smartphones. Like they say, you know, that there were some children like who couldn't stay out as late or couldn't go to certain venues, right? And you may throw your parents under the bus. Oh, my parents are really strict. That's absolutely fine, right? But that's what it looked like before smartphones. And now it may look a different way. And so what I would encourage the children and teens to say is that, you know, I'm to throw your parents on the bus if that's okay for your family, right? To say like, you know what, my my family lets me have access to my phone. I'm just making something up between like seven and nine, right? That's when I have access to that. So that's when I'll be able to respond to our group class. If you're going to, if you want to make plans, like, you know, if people have a landline or their parents' number or something that they want to call, you know, that they can do ahead of time that's more pressing or like they can find them at school. And the thing is, people like, well, they could miss out on some social opportunities. Like, teens aren't going to wait for them. And I would say, a good friend will find a way to connect with you to make sure that you find out about plans and that you're included, right? And if not, then you see the test of friendship, and they're likely not a good friend. And so I think this is something we saw before smartphones. It just looked a little bit differently. So I encourage families to develop a same time plan that's consistent with their values and then helping their teens communicate with their peers so that they know when they're available. How would you navigate the conversation where, you know, if it's a true friend will actively seek you out when everything is so easily at your fingertips, if you're say, for example, like I'm the teenager who's unavailable because I don't have a device and I end up being left out from everything. The, your, your true friends will find you conversation. I feel like can only take you so far before a teen would start internalizing that. Um, how would you approach that type of conversation where if it's a repeated, repeated behavior, both on the teen's part and their friend's part? I would have conversations with teens to say that you're like, I'm wondering what would be helpful to help you communicate with your friends to help make sure that you are notified in some way. Like, what would feel helpful? So then you're not coming in into like lecture mode, right? Because we're much more likely to hear what you have to say if you create a space to be invited in, right? And if they say like, I don't know what to say, like, what do I do? You know, then you have an opportunity. Like, would it be helpful to kind of brainstorm something that you could say? Again, another way offering an invitation. And then you can help them learn to advocate for themselves. It's a skill that will take them beyond communicating, you know, via on screen or not. I mean, it's something they can communicate like, hey, you know, like I've noticed that people are making plans or in the day. I get that I'm not available until later and that could be an inconvenience. What would be the best way that would work for you to make sure that I would really love to be involved, you know, but I want to make sure that you know, I'm only about the same. You know, and sometimes, you know, people are just not keeping that in mind. They're like, oh, I need a reminder or, um, you know, however it is that they want to make sure that they communicate with each other. Like, check in with me at this time. I'll let you know what's up for the weekend. I think that advocacy piece of advice is super helpful because a lot of folks end up with social anxiety or some aspects of social anxiety. And one of those big things is you don't want to be left behind, but you're also, you have fear of speaking up and standing up for yourself because you don't want to look like you're an outlier. So I think, you know, being able to, I don't want to say get over that, but start to overcome that at a younger age is just so much more empowering than trying to learn that skill when you're an adult. You recognize that this is a skill that they can take with them beyond this situation, right? If you can generalize it. Exactly. Uh, I'm curious about if there are any gender differences in terms of frequency as like frequency of phone or social media use as a predictor of anxiety and depression onsets. Um, an example would be like, are girls slash women more susceptible because of comparison behaviors due to what they're being exposed to? Um, so there have been differences found in terms of particularly the younger the age that one starts and then really affects the girls. I think it's also the, um, the body image and self-esteem concerns, particularly because they're seeing images over and over again that involve the use of filters, people only posting pictures where like they're looking their best, um, or even a, an enhanced version of themselves where I think particularly for girls that their bodies are changing um, and puberty and they see that I think that can have that they've seen some sex differences there. Can you talk a little bit about filter use and what it actually does to not only the mind of the person that's applying a filter, but the mind of the people that are being exposed to it? I can just store what 
your view of what a typical body type is like. I've even been reading where plastic surgeons have been saying that they've seen an uptick in requests for people to change their appearance to look like how they look with a Snapchat filter. And so it definitely had an impact on what you know people thought themselves to look like. Can you talk a little bit about ways to break the mindless scroll habit that a lot of us call self-care? Um, I know I myself am very guilty of this. At the end of the day, I will air quote unwind by checking up on what's happening on social media or on my phone. And I know a lot of folks have said that that's a helpful distraction, but for people like me, it's been five minutes and that's it. And before I know it, it's been 45 and I should have gone to bed a half hour ago. So how to help me help other people. <laughs> You're definitely not alone. Absolutely. It's, it's challenging, right? And it's easily accessible. And as we talked about it, that slot machine effect, it's very reinforcing. Your brain is getting a lot of dopamine. It's going to make you keep going. It's like with Netflix and they're like, just one more, just one more, right? And it keeps drilling to the next show to cut you off. So I would suggest like, if you find that like setting a timer for yourself, if that's helpful and you'll stop at the time it goes off, if you're someone where you're like, I'm just gonna hit that snooze button or turn it off, I'm not gonna follow that. You can schedule your screen time use plan when you're online, maybe perhaps before you have something else scheduled. So maybe perhaps you have a phone date with a friend and then that way like it's a hard stop, right? You're gonna be held accountable and you're doing something that doesn't involve necessarily looking at a screen rather than not being connecting with someone um, so that can be another way to be held accountable to, to stop if you find that setting an alarm clock would suffice. So I have to admit, it is becoming really difficult to tell what's true and what's not online. And this is beyond the concept of things being fake news, but there are a lot of conspiracy theories and a lot of bot accounts that push them. Um, do you have any suggestions on how to teach teens, and I would go so far as to say even some of our own peers, how to think critically to identify what's true and what isn't on social media. Um, I think it's really important. That's a part of it for parents to have conversations with teens, like what are their takeaways from the use, engage them in conversations, like, oh, I saw this pose, and you like, that can also spark a conversation of like, how do you determine what's credible and what's not, and to recognize like, what is the source of that information? Right, there are some sources that can be more reputable than others. Is it backed by science, for example? Are there facts that, like, are you seeing this across you know multiple places of reputable sources or sharing similar information? That means to teach them some tools to determine whether or not it's misinformation and disinformation, uh, so it's accurate. So I'm curious if you are often seeing folks who meet the threshold for addiction when it comes to device use. Um, and then I suppose a follow-up question would also be, what does digital addiction present as? Um, it definitely happens. I mean, particularly with the teens through my work, I think, you know, some people might use it as a form of, not to say addiction, but like avoidance, right? Or it's sort of like, um, if they're someone who's experiencing social anxiety, they're afraid of in-person interactions this would be sort of like one way sort of like a crutch, but then they may be more less likely to get out of the house because they have some form of remote access. And then there are some teens where they just feel like they're, they're losing sleep over checking their phones all the time. Um, researchers found that a significant number of teenagers are checking their phone in the middle of the night and it's disrupting their sleep, but they're finding that like they're checking it during school, they're distracted, they're not paying attention to what's being told or if it's an adult that they're checking all the time at work and it's, you know, reducing their productivity. I think these are signs, right, where someone might not be um, having, uh, might need to cut back on their screen time use. Do you have any advice for teachers who are dealing with kids that are on their phones all the time? Because I know as I've got several friends who are teachers who say, it's really hard to enforce it because uh, number one, they're using their phones for calculators and other research at, and like, you know, they're actually using it for educational purposes. But then the other part is sometimes parents get a little bit annoyed. You can't tell exactly what your kid is, what the kid is relaying to the parent at home. And then it comes back and it's, it's a difficult place to be in. 
I don't envy that position. I think it's going to be so tricky if they're using the phones, right, to access certain media. I wonder, you know, in terms of, like, they can come up with a plan of, like, they're using it for, like, briefly for something and then asking their students, turn your phones over. And so they can see that, like, the case is face up, right? Or if they can, like, flip it over and, like, do this one computation and then flip it over, let's have a discussion. Or if there's a plan where, like, they don't need to have it and the phones are in their backpacks or they're in their lockers, they're not, you know, but turned away but they're not using the thing but I think the more that schools can come up with ways where they don't necessarily need to use the phone to access information I think probably the better um, we have been able to to learn a lot before them so hopefully yes I did I did okay with my TI-84 <laughs> and Mac without an iPhone I think I'm gonna be okay knock on wood but <laughs> Uh, we had a provider write in saying that they're seeing a lot of middle school kids that are especially boys who can very easily access adult content online. And some of them are admitting to spending too much time looking at it in the same way that parents are telling the providers that kids are just spending too much time on social media. Is this something that you've come across? And if so, how do you suggest that uh, care providers address this? In terms of if it's with youth or it's adults, it sounds like it was with youth with this for this question, right? Yeah, so I, it seems like it's more youth focused because it says middle school kids, especially boys. But I'm I'm certain that this could apply to adults as well. Well, I think in terms of like it, it's important for parents to make sure that the, the sites that are being accessed are appropriate for their teens and their kids. So I think you know there are certain parental controls that can be put in place so that there are certain sites that cannot be accessed. And I think it can also be where you're reviewing the material, right, where certain sites that are being accessed at certain time points or teens so that, you know, there are those checkpoints in that respect. Um, if someone's finding like they are addicted to certain certain sites or certain media, I think um, there's a different, there's a different type of treatment that might be involved with that as well, right? Because some of the, the overuse of, um, those images or those videos can also distort one's perspective of how relationships um, actually unfold in real life too. Are you aware of any um, any research or results that have come up now that social a lot of social media platforms have been around for a decade plus? I want to say like Twitter's been almost 15 years and Facebook too, if my math is Anyway, I can't do math, but do you know if there's any, um, if there's any research that's been done in some of the like longer term use of social media and its impact on people's mental health? So um, there have been more in terms of like, in terms of like a longitudinal follow up where like some research has found that it wasn't necessarily the amount of time that was negatively impacting the roots. So that was more of a longitudinal study, but it had a, a narrow focus, right, in terms of like, it's not the amount of time that's actually negatively impacting someone. I think what research is suggesting now, it's the type of use that has a negative impact on one's mood, and it doesn't necessarily have to be more long term, it could be more immediate as well. Um, right, we were talking about the different ways, whether it's self oriented or other oriented. Um, how can folks, this is not necessarily teen specific, but how can folks deal with cyber bullies? This is something that, you know, it's a very um, emotionally fueled environment, I guess is really the only delicate way that I can put it, but it seems like people are just very reactive and that can be problematic. So how can we deal with cyber bullies? Um, I suggest dealing with cyber bullies in a similar way that I would suggest with in-person bullies is that as tough as it may be, I suggest removing all attention from them because likely what a bully wants right is to make someone feel smaller than they feel they typically don't feel very good about themselves right and so that they may say something hurtful online and feel even more emboldened to do so through a screen and if you engage back and forth you're giving them just what they want right is a reaction out of you that if you don't actually respond it's not going to be very motivating for them to keep going I think it's important if it has, you know, if it were a teen that's experiencing this, right, that they also are being open about like what they're experiencing so you can help support them through this. Someone wrote in and I'm, I'm genuinely curious about this. I have never heard this before they asked the question. My teenage son and his girlfriend chat on FaceTime before bed, proceed to leave it on all night long and then wake each other up in the morning because they're still connected to the same FaceTime session. This parent has asked around and apparently he's not the only young person doing this with either a friend or a significant other. 
Have you heard about this before? And do you have any suggestions for parents who might be experiencing this with their kids? If they're, that's a, that's quite a call and to an extended call to stay on. I mean, I, I appreciate that desire to remain connected. I find, I think that's, I know that's very lovely that they're feeling very excited about each other and want to, you know, say goodnight to each other and wake up to each other. You know, that's great that that, they have that positive connection. And I think it's really important for families when they're coming up with the screen time plan to talk about sleep hygiene, how having, you know, the screens on, with the blue light can um, actually suppress the brain secretion of melatonin, which helps the brain start to fall asleep. And so making sure there's a time where actually the phones get disconnected, you know, well before bed, and that they can still say good morning to each other when it's time, you know, earlier on, but they can do so in a different way. Um, if you find that like your plan is that they don't have access to screens until later in the day, then maybe they can come up with an alternative way to remain connected, whether seeing each other at school or something like that. It seems incredibly helpful. Um, had a few questions about apps. So first and foremost, what would be, do you have any suggestions for what would be considered a healthier app? Um, something that's actually going to strengthen your mental health or your fortitude. A social media app that improves your mental health? Not necessarily social media, but any, any digital app. Well, I mean, there are lots of apps that um, offer different mindfulness exercises like Headspace and things like that and Calm that people can use. And I think those can be really helpful. You also aren't, don't have to look at the screen to use them. It's more audio based. Um, and so I think those can be helpful. I think uh, not necessarily found the burn for like where social media apps have been like all, all around trying to like a boost to one's mental health. I do know that... Um... Pinterest has released research about, um, people's mental health when using their app. And most people, I think it's like 80% of people actually report feeling better after using Pinterest, but they also have some of the most strict guidelines in place. Like recently they just eliminated, um, like weight loss and like scammy exercise things. They like just refined all of their search results. And I know probably about a year ago or several years ago, rather, they were pretty, um, they were pretty aggressive in removing anything that was promoting eating disorders mm -hmm. from their platform. Well, I think, you know, there are a lot of people like, who like to look at like recipes, right, or crafts and things like home design. And so I think like, I can definitely see how that might be one of wealth. And I think like, I've also talked to people about curating their newsfeed, where you can actually, you know, remain socially connected with peers, but you can actually unfollow them or mute their posts so that you only see maybe you like follow some news organizations or you like uh, certain restaurants and seeing their posts. And so you just want to see those and you might find like you feel much better when you log on and you're only seeing like non-human posts. Um, so that's something I think about like with Pinterest. I think I could see a lot of that because a lot of those posts are not necessarily about someone's life updates. Exactly. Uh, if folks, if anybody listening uses Google Chrome, there's an extension that I personally use called Newsfeed Eradicator. Um, and between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., if I go on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn, there's no posts. It's really only an inspirational quote and you have to go in and manually disable it. Uh, and I found that actually to be very helpful oh, when trying to get things done. Um, it's my own. <laughs> It's my own little umbrella of protection to make sure that I'm productive at my job. That's great. I love that. Thank you for the suggestion. Do you have any advice for apps to provide digital limitations, not just for yourself, but for your kids? Um, so some families have found the Hour Packed app. I think that's free where it's um, our packed app is so you can actually set a time or like certain apps just disappear off of other people's phones. Um, you can still text and use the phone though, but it's like other like Snapchat and Instagram might disappear. Um, Disney Circle, that is one where you can have like all devices um, connected to it and it actually monitors like how many minutes each device is being used and things like that. You can even have like a tour plan on there and like a reward system. So it's very uh, dynamic in terms of what might be helpful. Um, and I think also just using, even like using um, the app, the people, like whatever uh, company that they use for their internet, there are often ones that you can actually have an app for that to look at parental controls and they also can limit restrictions on access. 
We have some folks asking about how addiction to social media differs from substance addiction. Um, and my follow-up question to that would be, do me, do, does detoxing, air quote, detoxing from social media actually work? In terms of like, if you take a break from it, are you no longer addicted in terms? Yeah. In terms of that? Yeah. I think it's, you want to come up with a plan find out like why someone is using social media. Like if some people are seeking it because they're seeking maybe perhaps like a, it's almost like a superficial way of getting reinforcement or like praise from people if they post like they want likes in a certain posts like what is it that they're trying to to fill is it a void of like their self-esteem or they feel disconnected from the world and I feel like then I would want to work on helping them foster social relationships that are in real time so I think like I would I think if you just like cut them up from social media are we just sort of like putting a band-aid on something and are we not necessarily healing what's going on underneath so I would be more inclined to look at what's driving the behavior. Out of curiosity, how do you yourself manage your social media limitations and your usage? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so it's not a secret for those who know me. I am very passionate about ice cream. And so um, anything that I may follow, like the only thing I see in newsfeed is like special flavors that may be posted on local stands. I like to support the local communities, particularly in the pandemic. So if I see their special flavor, I will go visit them. And in a real-time interaction with friends, family to experience their special flavor and to support those shops. But I don't actually see people's life updates. If I want to have a communication or if someone I see like posts, I like because I can get a notification I build, I will send them a direct message so that I can have a direct conversation with them and that it's not necessarily out in the public eye. Um, and that's more how I would use social media. And I, the other thing is like, I, um, I also, I love to learn. And so I, there may be like, in terms of like a undergrad alumni institution will share like articles or different, you know, different research that's coming out. I like reading that too. So those are some of the updates, ice cream and education resources. <laughs> the best of both worlds in my opinion. So, <laughs> all right. My follow-up question to that, which is totally unrelated to social media, but what is your favorite flavor of ice cream that you've had if you're supporting all these local places? Oh my gosh, this is like you're opening up Pandora's box. But if I have to pick just one, for those of you who are in Massachusetts, am I like allowed to promote a certain place? I have no connection to that. I don't get any kickback, but. Not a promotion. This is not hashtag sponsored anybody. Okay. I'm just saying, because I'm all about flavor. I also, I'm, I like s'mores. And so there's, there's a certain local stand that makes a really great s'mores flavor. So my final question for you is. Any last pieces of advice or words of wisdom that you'd want to share with folks tuning in about social media, how we're using it, and how we can better make it work for us instead of us working for them? So I I get that social media is it's going to be here for at least a very long time, if not the long run. Um, and so to find a plan that works best for you and your family, that would be my suggestion. Start collecting information for yourself, behavioral experiments about what works best, what might be not work so well. Um, but I also really will encourage people that if you're feeling it's a way that offers social connection, like in a way that's COVID friendly, find ways to have live conversations with people, interact with people directly. Those are some really satisfying, meaningful connections. Um, and, you know, if you can also use them to like leverage, you know, like support for local community organizations or events, then you go have those experiences experiences in real life. Um, so use it as sort of like a starting point to go then have in real time connections. I think that is a lovely way to end the session. And if I may say, if I may be so bold to say, this is the best hour of screen time that I have had this week. So, <laughs> thank, Dr. Thank Spur so Dr. Twirling, thank you so much for all of your insight. This has been really, really fascinating. Um, and I hope that everybody tuning in has learned as much as I have. Uh, so this actually concludes our session. But until next time, be nice to one another, be nice to yourself and get off your screen and go get some fresh air. You've totally earned it. So thank you again, thank Dr. You. Sperling. And thank you so much for having everyone. me. Have a great day. Okay.